Hello, Book Two. It's Tuesday, and I've got ten random books to show you. <laughs> I know I just showed you ten random books the other day, but I've got ten more to show you for no reason whatsoever. It's not ten random books Tuesday. It's not anything like that. I just feel like showing you ten random books. So sue me. <laughs> so the first one is a beautiful picture book. It's called Wings in the Light by David Lee Myers. And it's about wire butterflies in the United States, in North America. Uh, and it is not the book for you if you want a book. It's a longitudinal thing. Very nice, very distinctive on the shelf. But it's not the book for you if you want to learn a lot about each one of these individual butterflies. Because it's mostly just beautiful pictures with captions. Just all throughout. Uh, so you'll learn what they look like and where they are. Uh, and maybe that's all you want to know. It, in terms of the, the fascinating details of their evolution or their natural history, you won't get as much of that in this book as you would in maybe some other book that wouldn't be as beautiful. But this is beautiful. Uh, it, it's, it's given me endless hours of just sitting and staring pleasure. I don't have many of these butterflies in my immediate neighborhood, in, in the, the areas where uh, the bean and I go walking, but we do walk at least once a day uh, in the woods and in meadows and fields where we, where we see all sorts of things. I, it, this just enhances that feeling. So I, uh, I thought I would start with wings in the light. Uh, then we'll move on to something also picture related, but this is a kid's book. Uh, I love kid's books. This is written by Karma Wilson and with art by Matt Myers. And it's called a dog named Doug. And the dog named Doug loves to dig <laughs> as you can see from the cover. <laughs> Doug loves to dig. <laughs> he digs all the time. He digs everywhere. <laughs> the artwork is uh, is wonderful. And Doug is indefatigable when it comes to digging. Uh, which is a... It's a... And boy, did Doug dig. <laughs> See? The hole is the exclamation point. <laughs> like all great kids books this is every bit as much fun for an adult to look at uh, but it will speak to kids because they'll know that dogs dig uh, that, that's a, a behavior that a lot of them have I, most of the dogs that I've had in my life have not been just pointless diggers but dogs do enjoy it <laughs> that's, uh, that, that, that's what I love about this thing uh, then we've got something from years back this is a memoir by the novelist Penelope Lively this is Dancing Fish and Ammonites a wonderfully graceful volume. I got this originally from uh, the publisher. Uh, I got this originally from Viking in uh, uh, Okay, it's the only detail that anybody wants to know. It's the only thing that anybody wants to know about this book. Uh, so why don't you bury it in small print? 2013. Uh, I uh, I got this from the publisher in 2013, really, really liked it. I think it ranked rather highly on my end-of-the-year list, my Steve Reed's end-of-the-year list, which is trundling towards you, even as we speak. Uh, and then, for some reason, I got rid of my copy. I had to buy it again from the Brattle Bookshop. Uh, most writer memoirs are exercises in tooth-pulling tedium. This one is not. I strongly recommend it. Uh, then we have a talk about writer's memoirs that, that could be exercises in tooth-pulling tedium. This one is not. This is a classic. And by classic, I mean it in my definition of the word, which is which is ancient Greece and Rome. This is the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Now, this volume is from uh, Basic Books. It's an annotated edition, which can be really helpful. Uh, I think uh, probably if I had my druthers, every edition of the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius would be an annotated edition, just so that we're all on the same page. This is translated by Robin Waterfield, who's done a lot of great translations for Oxford World Classics. And it's very, very useful. It's very, very good. You don't need annotations to read the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. This is, these are the uh, the thoughts, the philosophical wanderings and uh, and the meanderings of the Roman Emperor, and that makes it fascinating all on its own. What we wouldn't give to have this kind of book for every historical figure, and here for a great Roman Emperor, we actually do have that book. Uh, it, Penguin Classics has made an edition of this. Oxford World Classics has made an edition of this. I believe translated by Robin Waterfield. It's uh, a staple of the Dubro centers of YouTube. Uh, it's a, a staple of cod stoicism being preached 
to fleece the masses by people who do not practice Stoicism. Uh, but it's also historically fascinating, just fascinating. And it's really good reading. It's all done by the editor uh, for all that we can tell, probably privately. Just astonishing that we have it. So I wanted to recommend it. And I also want to uh, just as a, you know, as a side note, recommend this annotated edition from Basic Books. It is actually very good. And then we'll go to a classic of history, big wampum thing. Uh, this is by Gordon Prang, and this is uh, At Dawn We Slept, his big classic study of the Japanese surprise attack on the U.S. military base at Pearl Harbor. Uh, where it originated in the Japanese command, how it was carried out, how it was such an enormous success, what happened minute by minute during the attack, uh, and the aftermath. It's all here in this book. Uh, Pearl Harbor's had many, many, many accounts. This one is terrific. Narratively, just in... in Morally, in terms of uh, the author's uh, worldview, this came out a long time ago. 1981, this came out. Still, as far as I'm concerned, the best book on the subject. And therefore, perfectly earns a place in a random-ass collection of books. <laughs> then, then this next one is a biography of a great literary figure, a literary figure who once upon a time, if you'd asked an ordinary literary person, or an ordinary book person on the street, who the greatest literary figure of their time was, they would have said this person. And then this person fell out of favor and is now largely forgotten. And before this person was largely forgotten, they, uh, they had a biography written of them by another literary figure who, if you had asked an ordinary person on the street, who's the greatest literary figure of your day, they would have said this later person, the, the guy who is the biographer. They're both gone now. They're both forgotten now. One great literary figure wrote a biography of another great literary figure, and history has forgotten both of them. Uh, and this is the, uh, the Life of John Dryden by Sir Walter Scott. <laughs> and like everything else that Scott wrote, it's terrific. Just terrific. Uh, I confess I'm not right off the top of my head cognizant of the details of how this book came about. I want to say that Scott probably put his name on what was largely the work of someone else. Uh, but if that's not true, and even if it is, he not only put his name on it, he polished it. It reads like Sir Walter Scott, which is all that anybody should care about. And it's about the great poet John Dryden, who is forgotten. I would love to have this, and this is a uh, not very well-made trade paperback that I have read a couple of times now. I don't think it's really up for another read. I'd love to have a hardcover of this thing, but it's probably expensive. It's a little bit on the odd side for a great writer to write a biography of another great writer. It doesn't often happen, although it did happen just a couple of years ago. Uh, Madison Smart Bell wrote a biography of Richard Stone. It's, that that doesn't usually of uh, Robert Stone. That doesn't usually happen, but uh, this is another perfect example of that happening. Uh, you could also find the same thing with Anthony Trollope writing a biography of Cicero. Uh, but in that case, history has not forgotten Cicero, and they haven't forgotten Anthony Trollope. It, Sir Walter Scott writing about John Dryden? <laughs> it's a doubleheader. Uh, then we have a memoir that a lot of you will know. Uh, it, it's a celebrity memoir. So when I saw it coming down the pike, I thought, well, I'll maybe read it, but uh, it's going to be heavily ghostwritten by someone else, and it's not going to be all that good. It's going to be very anodyne. It's going to be tame anecdotes made not to upset any apple carts. Uh, and I was completely wrong about that. It's, it's genuinely moving. Don't know about the first part. I don't know how much it was directly written by its alleged author. But it's a tremendously moving, wonderful reading experience. And that's Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. Uh, mainly uh, the parts that will move you the most about his mother. Uh, but also about his own upbringing. I loved it. And I wasn't alone. <laughs> I wasn't alone. I was surprised to love it. I read an advanced copy of it a little bit unwillingly. And I finished it thinking, boy, oh boy. That was tremendously heartfelt. If we want more than that from a contemporary memoir, we're asking too much. And then the whole of the reading world, not just the critics. The critics were all over this thing to love it. But also just general readers everywhere, heaping it with praise. Uh, to the point where I would dyspeptically say that Trevor Noah really should be a writer. He certainly made enough from this book to make any normal person feel like they were wealthy. And he still keeps up with all the stuff that he does that isn't writing, and I think that's a terrible shame. He, he has proven that he has talent as a writer. He ought to... His next book is going to be a runaway bestseller. It's going to be, again, make... It's going to make 
any normal person feel like they were extremely wealthy, like they were making a huge amount of money. It's only because he's living the over-leveraged Hollywood lifestyle that I guess maybe that doesn't register. I wish that it would. I guess I wish that Trevor Noah, he's not particularly good at anything else that he does. He's particularly good at this. He ought to concentrate on his next book. Uh, but this book, if you saw it and you had the same initial reactions that I did, uh, celebrity memoirs, you know, they're, they're very lightweight. I agree. They usually are. This one is not. This one will repay a reading. You will really like it. Um, this next one is by the uh, my one of my favorite writers, Murakami, of course. I'm I'm totally on the hype train when it comes to Murakami. Actually, I'm not. <laughs> this is a different Murakami. This is not Haruki Murakami. This is Ryu Murakami. This is Coin Lock Babies. A novel, a very weird, almost dystopian novel about two baby boys who are found in a train station pay locker. And what happens as they grow up? They develop a very incel attitude. They want revenge, long game revenge. They want to find the woman who left them there and have their revenge. And that desire takes them along very different life paths and that desire twists and transmutes along the way. And it's all wonderfully done. This is an old uh, Kodansha paperback uh, translated by Steven Snyder. Very, very good book. Don't know if Coin Locker Babies, these... These old uh, Kodansha paperbacks had dust jackets. Uh, I had a whole bunch of them. I think this is the only one I have left. And uh, I don't know if what form this book is in now or if it's in print now. But if you want a different Murakami to read, this is a terrific novel. Very weird. Very disturbing. Uh, then we'll do Library of America. This is an, uh, a, an American reprint line that's really, really good. Really solid book. Sewn bindings, acid-free pages, built-in bookmark really worth the, they're not cheap, but they're worth the money. And they hold up to punishment. You know, I could say the same thing about Folio or Franklin Press. They're very well-made books, worth the money, but I don't get them because they don't hold up to punishment. And it's if, if it doesn't, that you're out $150. Whereas the Library of America volume, they do hold up to punishment. They take a beating. And I love them. And this is, uh, this is a volume of collections about writings about the American stage. As an introduction by John Lithgow, and it uh, it goes, as you can see, all the way from Washington Irving to Tony Kushner. Just a ton of writings about the American stage, reviews of plays, analyses of uh, you know the state of the industry, the health of the industry, all that sort of thing. If you are a Broadway junkie, even if you don't go to Broadway, and how could you, right, since COVID shut it down, and even before COVID shut it down, you had to pay the mortgage on a house to get a ticket to a major show. That wasn't true once upon a time. Even as late as the 1980s, you could go to a Broadway show every week, living on normal wages, living in a normal apartment in the surrounding greater New York area. That is absolutely not possible anymore. But once upon a time, and for a long time it was, and this is a fantastic volume commemorating the great writing generated by that long heyday. So if you're a musical theater fan, or a theater fan just in general, who am I? What a volume. You're going to find so much great stuff. And like so many other great Library of America anthologies, it will tip you off to writers that you want to read more of. You'll find them in this anthology. You'll encounter them for the first time in this anthology or any other great anthology. And you'll suddenly realize there's an ocean of their own writing out there that you can hunt down and find. That This volume is also great for that. And it's a nice departure from the standard Library of America look of the, the black dust jacket with the red, white, and blue line across the middle. It's a, it's a nice departure from that to have curtains on there. Uh, and then we'll finish up with a graphic novel. This is a, a four-part miniseries done by Frank Miller with art by the great John Romita Jr. This is Daredevil, Man Without Fear. The rumor has it that this originated as uh, Miller's treatment for a screenplay for a Daredevil movie. And a lot of the things that are in here would have been uh, or have been sort of surreally adapted and warped and changed to make later Daredevil visual mythology. This is a Frank Miller's retelling of Daredevil's origin. Daredevil's origin as I encountered it for the first time on the newsstands and then in Stan Lee's great book, The Origin of Marvel Comics, is that little boy Matt Murdock is living in, in New York and his father, Batlin Jack Murdock, is a third-rate boxer who becomes, uh, who's told by a mob boss to, to fix a fight, to throw a fight. And he refuses to do it, and the mob kills him as a result. And this fires Matt Murdock not only to become a great lawyer, but also an, avenging, uh, an avenger of, of uh, wrongs, a writer of wrongs. But at the same time, young Matt Murdock 
uh, is in a car accident, a traffic accident, in which a bunch of radioactive glop lands on his eyes, and it blinds him and gives him hyper heightened senses. And so, in addition to being a lawyer, he also decides to put on skin-tight leotards and fight crime as Daredevil. Uh, Frank Miller uh, had a run on the comic book Daredevil, where he was the writer and the artist. Uh, and he mucked around on that run with the origin it was some of the origin elements of Daredevil, including introducing the fact that Daredevil was given his radar sense, not really by the radiation, but by a man named Stick, by a, a super society of, uh, of assassins that heightened his reflexes because he had amazing abilities or an amazing chi or whatever it is. I have no idea. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But uh, here, Frank Miller tells the origin story of Daredevil and gives us works in those elements. Uh, see, so you have young Matt Murdock practicing, but he's also being watched by Stick, by this figure who turned up uh, decades earlier in Frank Miller's run on Daredevil. Here we have uh, Matt Murdock as a boy on the tenements, and the thing that you'll see about this is that uh, Matt Murdock's art, or John Romita Jr.'s artwork is just incredible. He also introduces us to Elektra another character from that run on Frank Miller's Daredevil. Uh, just amazing, amazing visual stuff. Uh, very adult, very, uh, you'll never, it's not, it's not true John Romita Jr. art production unless a scene or two take place in the rain. <laughs> he has that down pat. Uh, but this is uh, Daredevil's origin story in a far more cinematic way, uh, uh, the cinematic way that you would do it, how it would really look. And it has a fantastic ending. Uh, the, the very last two-page panel in here is fantastic. I don't want to give it away. It's not a surprise or anything. It's just a beautiful end note. Frank Miller has a talent for that. And here, this is the basic story of the downfall of Batlin and Jack Murdoch. There's Matt Murdock in the audience watching his father win the fight he's supposed to throw. Uh, but also a very graphic depiction of, of his course of revenge after that. Very satisfying Daredevil graphic novel. So there you go. That is a random pile of books for Tuesday. We have Daredevil, Man Without Fear. We have The Library of America, a great anthology of American stage writing. We have Coin Locker Babies by the good Murakami. <laughs> we have Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. We have The Life of John Dryden by Sir Walter Scott. <laughs> we have At Dawn they, We Slept, uh, the, a great analysis, a great history of, of Pearl Harbor. We have the annotated Mark, uh, meditations of Marcus Aurelius from Basic Books. We have Dancing Fish and Ammonites, an uh, author's memoir by Penelope Lively. We have a dog named Doug about a dog who digs. <laughs> uh, and finally, we have uh, Wings in the Light, a picture book of uh, North American butterflies. And there you go. <laughs> those, are, those are ten random books just because I felt like showing you ten random books. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up. But I'll be back. Thank you, Book Two.